the submarine has dramatically changed the nature of naval warfare during the 20th century. Those who crew submarines have always considered themselves a special breed, a race apart from the surface navy, for they face dangers that the ordinary seaman does not. Since 1945, the submarine has seldom fired a torpedo in anger, but its threat has always been present, especially during the Cold War, which so overshadowed the world in the second half of the century. One of the very few submarines to sink a ship in the past 50 years was the British HMS Conqueror. During the 1982 Falklands War, she sank the Argentine cruiser General Belgrano. At one blow, this removed the naval threat that faced the British task force. But during the two world wars that dominated the first half of the century, submarines played a major role in the war at sea. Particularly important were the attempts by German U-boats to throttle Allied maritime supply routes in the Atlantic, Mediterranean and elsewhere. Some individual submarine skippers accumulated massive tonnages of ships sunk. They returned to port at the end of successful cruises in an atmosphere of triumphant celebration. But no U-boat skipper of 1939-45 came close to surpassing the achievements of one German submarine captain of 1914-18. Lothar von Arnold de la Perrière's grandfather was a French soldier who had offered his sword to Prussia after falling out with his superior. Subsequent generations served under the German flag, with Lothar himself becoming a naval officer. Before 1914, he served as torpedo officer on board the light cruiser Emden. Such was his promise as a naval officer that Arnold de la Perriere was also appointed flag lieutenant to Grand Admiral Alfred von Tirpitz, who was instrumental in modernizing the German Navy in the years leading up to the Great War. The outbreak of war in 1914 found Arnold de la Perriere on the staff of the High Seas Fleet. Designed to rival the British Grand Fleet, the German Navy was still inferior in strength and so adopted a policy of watch and wait. But service in Zeppelin airships attracted Arnold de la Perriere's adventurous spirit. The German Navy was using these to patrol the North Sea and soon they would be bombing England. De La Perriere's application was turned down, and so he joined the equally hazardous U-boat arm, carrying out his training at the port of Kiel. So well did he perform on his courses that at the end of 1915 he was given command of U-35. This was based in the Adriatic, at the Montenegrin port of Cataro, which is present-day Koto, and still a naval base. Naval action in the Mediterranean had intensified in March 1915, when the British and French began operations to seize the Dardanelles from the Turks and secure access to the Black Sea so as to join hands with their Russian ally. These operations culminated in landings at Gallipoli in late April 1915. This offensive prompted the Turks to request submarine support from their German ally in order to counter the Allied naval threat and throttle maritime resupply of the troops fighting on the Gallipoli Peninsula. The following month, Italy had entered the war on the Allied side and the Adriatic became an active naval theater. In the autumn of 1915, the Central Powers invaded Serbia and Montenegro. This provided the Austrians and Germans with the port of Kataro, which became the operational base for the steadily growing German U-boat flotilla. U-35, Arnold de la Perriere's first command, was just under 65 meters long and had been launched in April 1914. De la Perriere was her second captain. She was capable of a surface speed of over 16 knots 
faster than the average merchant vessel of the day. The electric motors used to power her when underwater could drive her at nearly 10 knots, but only for a limited time before the batteries had to be recharged. She had four torpedo tubes, but room for only six torpedoes. This meant that her main attack weapon was her 88 mm gun. U-35 had a range of nearly 9,000 nautical miles when surfaced, but only 80 when submerged. U-35's crew of 35 men had enjoyed some success under her previous captain. Now they wondered what the new one would be like as he came aboard for the first time. They would not have long to find out. At the time, the internationally agreed policy was that if submarines engaged merchant vessels, they had to be warned before being attacked. The crew had to be allowed to take to their lifeboats and, if possible, given a course to steer to the nearest land. Early in 1915, concerned over the ever-tightening British naval blockade, the Germans decided to ignore these rules and sink Allied merchant vessels without warning. In May 1915, a U-boat sank the liner Lusitania en route from New York to Britain with several American citizens on board. This caused an outcry in the neutral United States, but did not stop unrestricted submarine warfare. But the Germans did become concerned that a U-boat skipper might inadvertently sink an American ship and draw America into the war. So the focus was switched to the Mediterranean, through which few American vessels sailed. In spite of the growing success of the U-boats, the British still allowed their merchant vessels to sail singly. Forming merchant convoys was considered, but dismissed as being too difficult to organize. They also tied up too many warships as escorts. It was better, the argument went, to use warships in a more aggressive manner, patrolling the regular sea lanes in order to hunt down the submarines. This, however, did little to deter the U-boats. It was in this climate that von Arnold de la Perriere set off on his first cruise in U-35 in January 1916. It almost ended in disaster. U-35 came across a British Q-ship, a disguised anti-submarine vessel. This suddenly unmasked its guns and opened fire on the U-boat. Arnold de la Perriere was taken by surprise and U-35 only escaped by diving deep. Arnold de la Perriere then registered his first success when he sank a French transport. He ensured that all those on board had made their escape before sinking it with his gun. But on the 1st of March 1916, he had a fierce tussle with the British vessel Primula off Port Said on the Egyptian coast. He fired a torpedo which blew off the British ship's bows, but she then tried to ram him with her stern. It took three more of U-35's precious torpedoes to finish her off. In June 1916, U-35 made an impudent trip to Cartagena, on Spain's southeast coast. During the voyage, as always when there was no danger about, de la Perriere was keen to allow the crew to escape from the stuffy confines of the U-boat. He had been ordered to take a personal letter from Kaiser Wilhelm II to King Alfonso of Spain. Spain was a neutral country and the rule was that a warship of a combatant nation could remain in a neutral port for just 24 hours. U-35 honored this, but while she was anchored at Cartagena, she was subjected to much media attention. His mission completed, Arnold de la Perriere set about ravaging the sea lanes during his return voyage to Cataro. 
U-35 accounted for no less than 33 vessels. At the end of July 1916, Arnold de la Perriere set sail once more from Qatar. On her way out to the open sea, U-35 exchanged compliments with an Austrian cruiser, one of three that were active in the Adriatic at this time. Arnold de la Perrier's tactics for sinking ships were simple. On sighting a merchant vessel, he would order her to heave too. If she failed to do so, a shot across her bows was usually sufficient to bring her to a halt. He would then order the crew to take to their boats, but he was always concerned that they had sufficient food and water and the wherewithal to reach the nearest land. Then, if there was no perceivable threat from Allied warships, the La Perrier would send a party to board her and check her cargo. Sometimes, if the cargo included foodstuffs, he would take some to supplement the crew's rations. Turtle steaks and soup were a welcome change of diet. Usually, the gun crew would sink the vessel. Indeed, during her three weeks cruise at the end of July 1916, U-35 sank 43 ships using just four torpedoes, but 900 shells. Arnold de la Perrier was always punctilious about obtaining details of every vessel he sank, carefully checking it off against the copy of Lloyd's Register of Shipping, which every U-boat carried. Information given to him by the ship's crew and his own boarding party helped to identify her. By mid-1916, the Allies were growing increasingly concerned over the number of ships being sunk in the Mediterranean. Indeed, the war effort was being seriously hampered. Somehow, the U-boats must be stopped from getting out of the Adriatic and into the Mediterranean. If not, the British lifeline to India was in danger of being completely cut. The British had been successful in preventing German U-boats from getting into the English Channel from the North Sea by constructing a barrage of anti-submarine nets. These were strung across the Dover Straits at the entrance to the channel. The same system was now employed at the mouth of the Adriatic, from the Italian port of Otranto across to the Albanian coast. But the Straits of Otranto were 50 miles wide, while the width of the Dover Strait was a mere 20 miles. Consequently, given the available resources, the Otranto barrage was an imperfect defense, and the U-boats found it comparatively easy to slip through. In the meantime, as U-35 sinkings rose, so increasing honors were awarded to her skipper and crew. Indeed, U-35 had now become the most famous U-boat in the German Navy. Before 1916 was at an end, Arnold de la Perriere was awarded Germany's highest decoration for bravery, the Paul Le Merite. As his success continued, all that was left with which to reward him was a personal handwritten letter of commendation from the Kaiser. Yet Arnold de la Perriere always recognized that his achievements would not have been possible 
without the loyalty of his officers and men. By 1917, the war had become a stalemate. During 1916, the Germans had been involved in two exhausting, prolonged and bloody battles on the Western Front, Verdun and the Somme. The time had come to go over to the defensive in the West. The German high seas fleet had, in May 1916, finally ventured out to confront the British Grand Fleet in the North Sea. The Battle of Jutland was to be the largest naval action involving the two navies in both world wars. Losses were heavy on both sides, but those suffered by the Germans were such that the High Seas Fleet never again challenged the Royal Navy and stayed in port for the remainder of the war. The German High Command therefore decided that the only way in which victory could be won in the West was to throttle Britain by launching a renewed, unrestricted submarine campaign. This time, vessels sailing under neutral flag could be attacked at will. This new policy came into effect in January 1917, and there was an immediate marked increase in sinkings, especially in the Atlantic. In March 1917, U-35 sallied into the Atlantic from the Mediterranean, successfully evading the British naval squadron based at Gibraltar. De La Perriere accounted for another 17 vessels, using exactly the same tactics as before. On her return voyage, U-35 was forced to crash dive because of a marauding French seaplane. But this was the only scare that De La Perriere had during this cruise. U-35 arrived back in triumph at Kataro, having sent a further 54,000 tons of Allied shipping to the bottom. Some of Arnold de la Perrier's fellow U-boat skippers were taking maximum advantage of the fact that they were allowed to sink merchant vessels without warning. They had no hesitation in using torpedoes to do this, with no thought as to the fate of the crews of these ships. But Arnold de la Perrier continued to obey the laws of war to the letter, although he always ensured that his humanitarian actions did not put his own vessel at unnecessary risk. He still gave high priority to the safety of his victims' crews, and many had cause to be grateful to him. He did, however, sometimes take the captains of these vessels prisoner. One who suffered this wrote a letter to Arnold de la Perriere after arriving at Kataro. I cannot leave your submarine without just expressing my gratitude for the kind and courteous treatment I have received at the hands of you, your officers, and in fact the whole of your crew. The Allies reacted to the new campaign of unrestricted submarine warfare by strengthening the Otranto barrage as well as organizing their merchant ships into convoys with an armed escort. The strengthened barrage made it very much more difficult for the U-boats to get into the Mediterranean. The U-boats also experienced increasing frustration as the repair facilities at Kataro became overstretched. 
It was thus with relief that Arnold de la Perriere was ordered to return to Germany in the summer of 1918 to take command of a new U-boat. This was the ocean-going cruiser U-139, one of the largest submarines of the Great War. She was one and a half times the size of U-35, had six torpedo tubes, and was armed with two 150mm guns. Her crew consisted of 66 men. After working up his crew, Arnold de la Perriere set off in September 1918 for what would be his last cruise of the war. By this time, the sands were running out for Germany. Convoying, together with new anti-submarine weapons and detection devices, were making life very hard for the U-boats. U-139 sailed for American waters, and de la Perriere hoped for rich pickings but he was to find conditions very different. On his outward voyage, de la Perriere attacked a small convoy and experienced the power of the new Allied anti-submarine weapons. U-139 was forced to dive deep in order to evade the depth charges being used against her. His crew had to spend a lengthy period underwater while escort vessels continued their attacks. Nevertheless, de la Perriere managed to catch up with the convoy and sank one vessel. Later in the cruise, U-139 had a hard fight with a Portuguese armed trawler. De la Perriere then returned to port with more scalps on his belt. It was now the 15th of November, 1918, four days after the armistice which brought the war to an end had been signed. There were therefore no welcoming crowds for U-139. The German army was now withdrawing from France and Flanders back to its homeland, while the high seas fleet was in a state of mutiny. The German Navy, including the surviving U-boats, was now ordered to sail its ships to British ports to be surrendered. But Arnold de la Perriere could not face this ignominy and left his first lieutenant to surrender U-139. She and her sisters were handed over as war booty. Most were broken up and sold as scrap metal. Even though Germany was forced to scrap all offensive weapons, including tanks, and not permitted to have submarines, Arnold de la Perriere remained in the emasculated German Navy. This was a measure of his dedication. But de la Perriere served on to see the regeneration of the German Navy under Hitler. However, by the time war broke out in 1939, de la Perriere's seagoing days were over. In June 1940, after the fall of France, he was appointed as intermediary in the negotiations over the future of the French fleet. En route to visit French naval chief, Admiral Dallon, he was killed in an air crash. Lothar von Arnold de la Perriere's record of 194 ships sunk while in command of U-35 and U-139 has never been surpassed by a submarine captain. His achievements served to inspire the U-boats of 1939-45 and are a shining example to all submariners, past, present and future. <laughs>